Hi, welcome to International Finance Chapter 12 portion of the lecture today. Good. This is about uh, international bond, right? And um, as you see, I mean, uh, last time I gave you some special lecture about um, Rothschild's uh, bond issuance history. And then just like those, right? Those, you see another bond sample over here. Historically, the bond looked like this. And then you see on the right hand side, you see a lot of uh, coupons staying over there, right? Uh, you take out that coupon periodically and then bring it to the issuer and then get the payments, right? So that was the idea. Now, then the question becomes, well, um, depending on the tracking system of this bond, right? Um, this bond may serve as some kind of a wealth transfer tools. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, we're going to talk about that, right? Uh, some kind of a, a bond called bearer's bond versus registered bond, okay? For example, oh, if the bond, right, when, the, when it is issued, do they care about who is holding this bond or not, okay? Do they re record the name Andy Kim over there with my registration number, uh, more personal ID number, so much so that when I give it to my kids or my wife, right? And then my family, not me, gets redeemed or, or go to the issuer and say, pay me back, pay me back, right? Then would the tax agent get here, IRS get here and say, you pay tax or not, okay? Uh, or not what do you mean there are some bonds who does not okay historically you can see that right um, there must be a lot of bonds who doesn't care that does not track uh, the record of the bearers right and whoever have those document will receive the cash okay so that could be uh, a loophole or kind of a you know a tool to give uh, transfer his or her wealth to their descendants so that is an issue okay tax agents and then the government has been very keen on this kind of things and regulate it somehow and number two um the the bond issuers uh, credit quality and all these kind of things right because the bond investors they buy and sell okay to a third party right they don't know and then these guys these guys bond investors do not inv uh, do not investigate those issuers the corporations too much um so much so that uh not that not to investigate too much but uh what i'm saying is those tens of thousands of bond investors right uh, to be able to invest in this kind of corporations, right? They need to have clear information about the corporations, right? So somebody has to make sure that these issuers, the corporations, they disclose enough of information or they be transparent, okay? Um, so there is a lot, lot of regulation going on, okay? Um, if it were bank lending, right, instead of bond issuance, right, bank lending, which is another form of borrowing from the perspective of the corporations, where the bankers keep on monitoring the borrower, okay? Um, so it's a bank's responsibility to make sure this guy is working all right, okay? Otherwise, the bank will be screwed altogether, right? So it's a bank's job, diligently monitoring the uh, borrower of the loans. But when it comes to corporate bonds, right, there's no such thing as commercial bank who is co constantly monitoring it. Those investors who is temporarily buying and selling and buying and selling, they you know, we will try to look at your company, but that intensity is not that much. So who will be you know, monitoring? this kind of uh, bond issuers is an important issue. 
Um, anyway, so um, chapter outline of this is that uh, we're going to talk about the bonds market, statistical perspective, and you'll see all kinds of interesting features in this bond, right? Uh, foreign bonds versus euro bonds, we're going to talk about it. Um, and then bond classification, right? Essentially, uh, we're going to learn about it. Straight fixed rate issues and euro midterm notes and floating rate notes and equity related bonds like convertible bonds and bonds with warrant, dual currency bonds or cocktail bonds. Um, and then um, currency distribution, nationality, types of issuer, international bond market credit ratings. We're going to talk about it. S&P and then Moody's and all these kind of guys. What do they look for? Well, quite simple, just like what you've studied in your intermediate corporate finance before. And then uh, euro bond market structure and then practices. Oh, by the way, for, for, for international finance purpose, those rating agencies will look at uh, country level issues, right? But the intuition is the same, right? Whether it is corporation or the country, it's about the cash flow. Strength of cash flow, is it strong enough to cover the debt burden, okay? Debt burden, which is interest expense and then principal repayment, that kind of things. So that intuition sustains. Um, bond market structure and practices, primary market, secondary market, what do you mean by that? And then clearing procedures, um, market clearing, right? And then international bond indices, we're gonna briefly talk about those things. Now, uh, world's bond market, the total bond, uh, market value of the uh, world's bond markets are about 50% larger than the world's equity markets. So I told you before, mm. um, even though a lot of media attention goes into equity market, like stock market, oh, S&P 500 plunged like by like 5%, oh, crazy. Um, but that's a kind of a small show compared to smaller size compared to the bond market okay at least 50 percent larger than the stock market okay um why is that the case of course uh, it's about it's about uh, um, diversification of your assets right your investment asset has to be allocated at least into three different categories uh, Keynes said this one right john maynard say uh, kane said what uh, one third in your real estate, one third in your bond, one third in your stocks, right? So um, these two things, right? We are comparing it. Of course, if you think about Korean market, disproportionately more of your asset is stuck with the real estate market. Okay, why is that the case? Well, a strange scheme is going on. Okay, strange structure of real estate market in Korea forces us to do it that way okay the lifetime goal about korean uh people it seems like whether you have house or not whether you have land or not kind of things uh which is crazy um anyway by and by by uh, or younger people okay or like myself or something right who are more experienced with the uh, international right living environment we realize that oh why do we spend so much effort on this uh uh, real estate, right? So we get we get, we get more skeptical about it. Um, in uh, so anyway, that's that. The U.S. dollar, the euro, and pound sterling, and the yen are the four currencies in which the major uh, majority of domestic and international bonds are, are denominated. So in which currency is it denominated? You saw it in the Rothschild's case. Uh, most of the time, it was uh, denominated in British pound, even though the issuers were uh, non-British governments, right? Uh, French government, Spanish or Japanese, they were borrowing in uh, British pounds, right? So that's kind of a uh, international bond already, okay? Um, and then proportionately more domestic bonds than international bonds are denominated in US dollars and Japanese yen, uh, while more international bonds than domestic bonds are denominated in the euro and the pound sterling, British pound, right? Why is that the case? If you look at this table over here, right? Uh, exhibit 12.1 tells this story, right? Um, if you look at domestic bonds, right? 
44 uh, percent okay US dollar takes up about US, US dollar denominated bonds take up about 44 percent of world's domestic bonds whereas US dollar denominated bonds take up about 40.4 percent um, in international bonds arena okay why is that the case? Because the United States, their domestic corporations, non-bank corporations, they take up so much of a, uh, I mean, they are so big, they are so big, so that their borrowing with bonds, right, is so much big in U.S. dollar terms, okay? Um, like 32, what's that? 32,000 billion, which is 32 trillion, okay? Uh, like this compared to international bonds denominated in US dollars right so US economic size is big that's why in Japan it's also the same case right um, their domestic corporations are already big enough so that most of the Japanese yen denominated bonds they are um, domestic bonds right in contrast British pound British pound well their domestic economic size other than financial industry is small uh, whereas their British pound is popularly tr uh, 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 popularly um, circulated around the world so that's why um, international bonds uh, portion okay uh, in British pounds portion in international bond market is a lot bigger than their portion uh, uh, in domestic bonds mar uh, market right euro is the same thing right um, even though the euro economy size is big, right? Uh, compared to the uh, compared to U.S. or Japan, right? It's still far away to go. Okay, that's why. And then the euro currency is much more popularly uh, traded. So that's why. Now, um, moving down, classification of bonds. Well, there are a lot of different ways to classify bonds. Okay, international bonds. Um, as I said before, there are something called bearer's bond and there are something called registered bonds. Bearer's bonds don't ask who you are. Whoever brings this piece of paper gets the money, okay, at the maturity. So you can transfer your wealth to your <laughs> sons and daughters without being asked by any tax agents. Come and say, yeah, you pay the tax. In contrast, registered bonds track down your identification number. And then when you transfer your bond to well, your, your family members, right, they will have to register their name totally new to the book of the bond issuers, right? So that my name will disappear, my son's name or my daughter's name will be shown up next. And then this is easily, you know, for the tax, uh, the government, right? Uh, IRS, they can track down to you and then get back to you and say, you pay tax, right? Um, so you see that the trade-off over here, which one will be popular among the capitalists and then the investors, right? Which one would you prefer, okay? Um, obviously, bearer's bond. Um, registered bond, government prefers, right? And then the national security registrations, all these kind of regulations matters over there. And then they also, the, the funny thing is, the international governments, right? While they have to maximize, the, the, the US government or Korean government or those governments, they have to maximize their tax revenue. So they prefer this kind of registered bonds structure. But at the same time, they're competing against each other uh, to attract, not to lose big investors so they are you know working on this kind of regular regulatory changes and then uh, there are some withholding tax issues those things are uh, stated in the textbooks so you can go ahead and read it and recent regulatory ch changes all those issues right um, so you can uh, refer to the textbook about it I'm not going to discuss it over here and then global bonds right global bonds well um, they, th there are some bonds people issue internationally, right? But not just in one country, but in many different countries, many different currencies, um, and one shot, 
Okay, so that is an interesting part about global bonds. Um, classification of bonds continued the foreign bonds versus euro bonds. And there's an interesting classification of international bond, right? So here's the way I understand foreign bond, first of all, okay? They have typically very interesting names, by the way, okay? Like Yankee bonds, samurai bonds, or uh, kind of arirang bond kind of things. We're going to uh, see it, right? Foreign bond is like this. Let's say here is Volkswagen in Euro currency regime. Okay, Volkswagen over here. But this guy operates in the United States. Here it is United States of America. Okay, and then they have a factory over there, right? So, over here they have it. Okay, the thing is to operate in the United States, what do you need? You need a US dollar to um, pay to the workers in UAW and then all these kind of uh, labor unions and then the materials that you buy, right? So, you need US dollars, okay? So, in U.S. the so Volkswagen issue U.S. dollar denominated bonds. Okay, so bonds I would say, da -da -da. like this, right? Bonds. They issue U.S. dollar bonds in U.S. in uh, where uh, while they are actually European company. Okay, so this is a um, an example of foreign bond called Yankee bond because this is issued in the United States and then sold to the investors in the US okay Yankee bonds um, another example is if Volkswagen goes to Japan or shall I say Korea yeah because there are a lot of uh, Volkswagens in Korea so here is Korea um, This is Korea, and here is Seoul, okay? Volkswagen comes over here and issue, an issue, Korean one denominated bond, okay? Um, issue bonds in Korean one denominated bonds, they issue it and sell it to Korean investors okay this is another foreign bond okay issued by German one in full Korean currency right what's the name of it well we call it Arirang bond okay Arirang, 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 Arirang. this is a Korean traditional song okay that's why they call it Arirang bond. Whenever you foreign buyers come in, foreign investors or whoever comes in, we treat them into for dinner and then we take them to Arirang place, kind of you know singing and dancing. That's why Arirang bond is there. Okay, Yankee bond, Arirang bond, and let's say Volkswagen went to Japan. Where are you, Japan? Yes, here you are. Okay, and then issue Japanese yen denominated bonds over here and sell it over to Japanese investors okay this is another form still another form of um, foreign bond and this is called samurai bond because you know this is Japan samurai right um, and then if you do that similarly in Britain they call it bulldog bond and all you know all these kind of things happen right um, so let's see the list of the names right if you do this kind of things in China panda bond right um, in America Yankee bond if you do it in Netherlands Rembrandt bond okay if you go to Australia kangaroo bond right um, that's foreign bonds names in different nationalities right different currencies they issue 
Euro bond is a bit different. Okay, a bit different. Um, but it's named funny as well. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So let's say um, there is a Heineken. Yeah, Heineken. What country is it from? Of course, Netherlands. Yeah, right. A Dutch company, right? If they issue bond in um, Swiss, right, Switzerland, right, and then in Switzerland, um, they are issuing in U.S. dollar, okay, bond. US dollar bond in Switzerland okay and this is going to be called euro bond this is not in US dollar um, regime Switzerland is obviously they have Swiss franc okay but they issue US dollar bond right whereas foreign bond you're issuing foreign currency denominated bond in their domicile euro bond not in the domicile of the currency okay make sense um so that's something called euro bond euro dollar okay, euro bond so uh depending on the currency you have all kinds of euro bonds all around okay um you just have to be okay issuing in different country from the domicile country okay um right so not in the u.s but other countries okay um so this kind of bond issuance also happens in different countries depend depending on the currency that you are working on okay uh when it comes to korean one right korean one denominated bond if it is issued outside Korea, okay, that's going to be called kimchi bond. All right, why is that so? Kimchi is so much exported outside, and then so, uh, has Korean taste in it, uh, so that's why it's called kimchi bond. Um, and then shogun bond is for Japanese yen bond issued in other countries than in Japan. Okay, dim sum bond. Well, that's about China. Okay, I don't know why they call it dim sum. Why don't? What about kung fu? You, because you have uh, panda over there, right? Why don't you have kung fu bond, right? But they have dim sum bond, right? Um, if Chinese yuan denominated bond is issued somewhere outside China, okay, dim sum bond actually um, is the one that was issued in Hong Kong before, right? Hong Kong. Why do I say Hong Kong before? Because there is a uh, political, geopolitical uh, event going on right now. Okay, a huge uncertainty associated with this uh, Hong Kong, by the way, right? Uh, today or yesterday or tomorrow, uh, the China, you know, has some strict policy about Hong Kong. It's going to be one rule. Uh, but why did I say dim sum bond? Uh, is a euro bond of Chinese yuan, okay? Because Hong Kong has their own Hong Kong dollar instead of Chinese yuan, okay? So a different currency regime, uh, and then they are still issuing Chinese uh, denomina yuan denominated bond, and that's called a dim sum bond, right? So just to confuse you back again, if Chinese yuan bond is denominated bond is issued inside China, inside China. That is called panda bond, right? Panda bond versus dim sum bond, right? So all these kind of distinctions happen, and they bring some kind of a funny name in it, um, because why? Why funny names like this? Because finance is kind of boring if you don't have this kind of fun factors, right? So uh, let's do it. Okay. 
Now, international bonds amount outstanding classified by major instruments. Uh, it looks like this, uh, depending on the different time point that you take a snapshots. Okay, 2011, 12, 13, 14, and 15 first quarter. In the textbook, it says like this. And then the instrument, what kind of instrument, bond instrument do we have? Straight, fixed rate bond, float rate notes, and convertible issues and with equity warrants and then the total amount right and this one these are in the US in billions of US dollar terms right so what you can see uh, is that uh, out of 20 trillion US dollars worth about 13 to 14 trillion US dollars worth is issued in the form of straight fixed rate note a uh, fixed rate bond uh, the conventional bond that you've seen in your financial management class coupon 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 fixed amount fixed amount and then principal okay that's straight fixed rate okay the next one is a floating rate notes we're going to learn about it a little later but this is about your coupon being fluctuating oh my god fluctuating the coupon used to be fixed right but here it's supposed to be fluctuating together with the market interest rate okay um they set the coupon rate like a six months before right uh okay over the next interval right next time period um the coupon rate will be some fl floating interest rate market interest rate that we see today plus some um Default spread, that's the idea of floating rate notes. And then con uh, that's uh, only about what? Six out of 20, like 30% or f uh, what's that? Um, five out of, out of 20, like a 25 to 30% of the bonds are issued in floating rate forms. And then convertible issues, well, uh, a lot smaller portion. Well, this is a uh, conversion feature, conversion option, okay? Converting it to what? To equity, okay? Um, so a lot of corporations use this kind of convertible, op uh, convertible bonds to finance their projects. And then uh, with equity warrants, this is a right uh, for right to claim the next equity issuance, all right? So, those are there but they're minor portion absolute majority of them straight fixed bonds okay good next one is bearer bonds versus registered bond i, I told you before bearer bonds are bonds with no registered owner as such they offer anonymity right in the dark in the dark right uh, but they also offer the same risk of loss as currency okay um and then registered bonds are bonds. I mean, as long as it is international bonds, you, you're exposed to FX risk, uh, that's what I'm saying. Registered bonds are bonds where the owner's name is registered with the issuer. US security laws require Yankee bonds. Yankee bonds, I told you, okay, um, to be registered as long as this bond, right? US dollar denominated foreign bonds, right? As long as this guy is sold to us investors this bond has to be a registered bond so that irs could track down those bond investors Ooh, you make sure you don't give it freely to your sons and daughters okay not to speak of your granddaughters that's what they are saying okay uh national security registration yankee bonds must meet requirements of the sec just like the US domestic bonds, many borrowers find this level of reg regulation burdensome and prefer to raise U uh, US dollars in the Euro bond market. Um, and then I told you before, like investors, right? They're always doing hide and seek with the tax agency of the government, right? So that's why. And Euro bonds sold in the primary market in the U United States may not be sold to US citizens. Of course, US citizens could buy a Euro bond on the secondary market, um, right? Uh, secondary market, what do you mean? 
Well, primary market versus secondary market is that primary market is where, where you initially offer the security to the investors public, right? Public investors. Secondary market is all the things happening afterwards, right? Again, the primary market is when you issue the bond for the first time, issue it, and then say, issue it, right? Um, issue it and then sell it for the first time, okay, to general uh, public investors. And then afterwards, whatever happens among those investors buying and selling and trading in all different ways, that's secondary market, okay? So, of course, US citizens could buy Euro bond on the secondary market. A Euro bond like this, Switzerland, okay, US dollar denominated bond is issued. And U.S. people go there and buy it. Yeah, as long as it is secondary market. Once it is traded, you can buy that, right? Um, so that's that. Withholding taxes, well, uh, withholding tax. Um, trying to remember Korean terminology for this one. Uh, anyway, um, prior to 1948, uh, 84, the United States required a 30% withholding tax on interest paid to non-residents who held U.S. governments or U.S. corporate bonds. The repeal of this tax led to a substantial shift in the relative yields on the U.S. government and euro dollar bonds, and this leads uh, this lends uh, credence credence to the notion that market participants react to tax codes changes. Now. Um, security regulations that ease bond issuance is also there. Shelf registration, okay, uh, is also uh, here. There is an issue. What is a shelf registration? Well, each time you um, issue a bond, right? Um, well, you don't issue bond um, so frequently, but. Um, Whenever you issue a bond, you have to register to the SEC or Kumyung Gamdo One in Korea Financial Supervisory so that they could monitor you a little bit and make sure everything is okay. Uh, you're transparent and your accounting on everything is doing all right. Uh, so much so that the public investors will not get screwed up. Okay, uh, so those registration process is there for each bond issuance right each time you battle through this bond market but it is so tedious and then painful so much so that there are some schemes called ways to call the shelf registration okay they say uh, just do your registration in a one bunch right um, and then this time this year you're issuing a new security based on this uh, shelf registration partially you issue bond this time and a couple of years later you issue bond the next time uh, the next amount and then the remaining amount you issue bond in like five years or ten years later on so it shelf registration is like a um, those condensed uh, registration process in one shot for multiple security insurance uh, multiple bond issuances so it allows the issuer to pre-register a security issue and then offer the securities when the financing is actually needed, okay? Um, so, and then SEC Rule 144A is also there, and it allows qualified uh, institutional investors to trade private placements. Um, private placements, what do you mean? Well, instead of issuing your bond to general public, right, in an uh, in a open way, Private placement is like among those uh, investors connected to this investor banker, right, underwriter. Um, they are privately transacting it with each other. Um, so that's private placements. And then qualified institutional investors are also allowed to do this kind of things under the SEC Rule 144A. And these issues do not have to meet the strict information disclosure requirements of publicly traded issues. Again, this has to do with the, um, the, for the safety for the public investors in the market, right? Uh, the government always are concerned about, oh, public investors, if they get screwed altogether, 
that's going to be troublesome okay for the public opinion and then the national economy all those things will be screwed so they want to make sure but as long as your bond issuance is private placement or some kind of smaller size smaller scale then you can bypass this kind of uh, bypass this kind of heavy regulation of monitoring or scrutiny global bond, global bonds well it is a very large international bond offering by a single borrower that is simultaneously sold in America, North America, Europe, and Asia. So simultaneously sold in all continents or all different countries. Uh, global bond issues were first sold in 1989 in global bonds de denominated in US dollars and issued by US corporations trade as Euro bonds, overseas and domestic bonds in the US. And then Deutsche Telekom, right? Global bond issuance is over here, right? Now, um, what did they do? Well, the, it was it was the largest corporate global bond issuer uh, to date in the ninth, uh, uh, fourteen point six billion dollars worth, right? Deutsche Telekom multi currency offering. The issue includes three U.S. dollar tranches with. 5-year, 10-year, and 30-year maturity is totaling $9.5 billion. So, tranche is a French word, by the way. Okay. Uh, trench, a kind of, you know, one series of uh, armies that is fighting against you, right? Um, trench, 참호 속에, 병사들, kind of, you know. Do, 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 do. Uh, so, one series of fundings one bunch is kind of a trench right so one bunch uh, uh, that has three US dollar trenches with uh, five ten thirty year okay all different maturities all different maturity bonds in one package in one currency over there and then two euro trenches right so the different currencies with five years and ten years maturity totaling three billion euros uh, so you, if you think about the total amount, you subtract the first tranche, right? Uh, you get about what? Um, 5.1 billion US dollars worth. And out of that 5.1 US dollars worth, about $3 billion is uh, issued in, in Euro, term, uh, Euro uh, currency terms. And then uh, the last one, oh no, no, the second last one is about British pound sterling tranches. So the remaining amount, uh, part of it was British pound worth about 1 billion uh, or 950 million pounds, five year and 30 year maturities, right? And then five year Japanese yen tranche of uh, 90 billion yen, okay? So uh, one, two, three, four, four different currencies and then uh, currencies tranches are there and then um, in terms of maturity, you have like a one, two, three, uh, three different kinds of maturities were there, right? So, um, global bond, the key issue is that you're issuing this bond in all different currencies. Why do you issue this in these different currencies? Because you have globalized uh, supply chain that you have to pay them, right? And then you have global exposure. That's why, okay? Um, and then types of instruments, uh, straight, fixed rate, debt, float rate notes, equity related bonds, zero coupon bonds. Oh, does it sound familiar? Yeah, intermediate corporate finance, ZCB, yes. And dual currency bonds and composite currency bonds. Things get more complicated, but let's not worry too much, okay? Uh, We're gonna go through in a lighthearted way, I think, okay? Um, exhibit 12.3. Typical characteristics of international bond market instruments look like this. Um, instrument, you see one, two, three, four, five different class, uh, ki kinds. And strict, uh, straight fixed rate, float rate, convertible bonds, and straight fixed rate with equity warrants and dual currency bonds. Frequency of interest payments, well, straight fixed rate, um, typically it's annual. Uh, floating rate, frequency of interest payment is about quarterly or semi-annually. They reset, they reset the next in, uh, coupon 
uh, every quarter or every semi-annually. Okay, convertible bonds typically it's annual coupon bond, and then straight fixed rate with equity warrants again annual coupon bond and dual currency bonds annual coupon bond. Okay. Um, size of coupon payment, well, except for flo floating rate notes, everything is fixed, okay? And then payoff at maturity is that uh, currency of issue and the currency of issue for the straight uh, or and the float rate notes. In convertible bonds, it says currency of issue or conversion to equity shares. So uh, if you don't convert it to stocks, right, you will get the amount due, uh, principal amount due uh, at the end of maturity in that specific currency. Um, interesting thing is, right, um, dual currency one, right? The dual currency bonds, well, um, at the end of maturity, you may get uh, different currency denominated. Uh, payments, right? Uh, so you're gonna see an example later. Now, straight bond, okay? These are plain vanilla bonds with a uh, specified coupon rate and maturity and no options attached. A lot of Korean students ask, what do you mean st straight, uh, plain vanilla? It's like meaning nothing special, okay? Quite a standard ones, right? Plain vanilla, okay? Ice cream. Right, ice cream, plain vanilla, as opposed to chocolate or strawberry or what? Uh, cherry Jubilee, Amman uh, again, kind of things, right? Um, so that's that. Since most euro bonds are bearer bonds, ooh, coupon dates tend to be annual rather than semi-annual. Okay. Um, the vast majority of new international bonds offerings are straight fixed rate issues. And then floating rate notes, right? FRN, we call it FRN. Just like an adjustable rate mortgage, right? The common reference rate, right? I said, I said the uh, coupon payment, coupon amount fluctuates, varies together with the market interest rate, okay? We call it the reference rate. And then when it comes to the reference rate in the global capital market, LIBOR dominates, right? I told you before about the problem with LIBOR and then it, the fact that it is going to be changed into some other rates, um, but uh, we hope that will happen uh, without any uh, crash in the market or bump in the market, but uh, let's hope for the best. Since floating rate notes reset every 6 or 12 months, the premium or discount is usually quite small, right? Um, as long as there is no change in the default risk. Floating rate note, let's say Samsung Electronics issued on FRN at LIBOR plus um, 125, no, 0.125 percentage point or 12.5 basis points, right? LIBOR plus 12.5 basis points. Semi-annual coupon, and then the coupon rate is fixed at the beginning of every six months. Then um, current LIBOR rate is 5.7%. What is the coupon amount on a uh, 10, uh, what is the coupon amount on a $1,000 face value? Okay, that would be, um, yeah, did I, sa did I say it in a screwy way? Yeah, 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 sorry about that. But here you see in the mathematics, right? $1,000 face value times half, because this is semi-annual coupon, right? Half times LIBOR plus 12.5 basis points. The basis points is like 0 0.0001. That's one basis point. So this is 12.5 basis points, okay? Now, you add these two, you'll get to the interest uh, coupon rate for that period. And then times half, times principal, that's 33.625, right? So standing at, standing at the beginning of the period, beginning of each period, zero, uh, half, 
Uh, come on. Right. Yeah. So, um, so you stand over here, right? And then going into six month horizon with the LIBO rate that you see over here, right? Add some spread. You can compute how much you will have to uh, get paid, okay? Or if you're the issuer, you will have to pay later, okay? So you can compute uh, standing at the beginning of the period that the amount that you're going to receive at the end of the period okay um, period by period by period and then this interest rate LIBOR rate okay it's market-based one it fluctuates so that your coupon amount will be floating like a fluctuating okay? floating rate that's why we call it floating rate notes okay now the number two thing important thing is interest rate risk you know every bond has interest rate risk right what do you mean by that well the coupon payment was the issue okay um fixed coupon payment you have to promise it right but the discount rate or the market interest rate fluctuates floats right Together with that, your value of the bond fluctuates, okay? Because of the fixed coupon payment. We call it interest rate risk. The value of your asset changes, okay? As the market interest rate changes, okay? How about floating rate notes, okay, floating rate bond? Does it have interest rate risk? And the answer is yes, but very small degree. Why? Almost non-existent. Okay. Why is that the case? Because the coupon payment is not fixed, but it's moving together with the interest rate. Okay, moving together with the interest, so that uh, except for the spread amount, right? Um, there is something like that. So it is the interest rate risk is minimal. Right, FRN. So that's that. Now, um, the next slide. Um, yeah, Samsung Electronics, let's say, right? The same, LIBOR plus 12.5 basis points is the same. If on the next is reset date, six month LIBOR is 5.7%, which means in this diagram over here, right? In this diagram that you saw before next reset day means this one okay first reset day it's the second uh, I mean initial setting day and then the first reset day I should say this way reset 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 every six months so at this point the LIBOR change okay so what would be the coupon amount that you have to think about okay here's the next question um, right that is all you need to do is just to change this LIBOR rate and keep the remaining items the same and you will get a um, new coupon payment that is due after six months after six months right so in previous slide there the coupon amount was supposed to be 33 Point six five dollars per one thousand dollars of par value or face value the next uh, period right the uh, coupon amount is as decreased uh, twenty nine point one two five dollars per one thousand dollars face value of bond right uh, what you see over here the coupon amount right um, decreased as the LIBOR rate decreased from 6.6% to 5.77%, right? Um, the coupon amount decreased from 33.6 to 29.1, okay? So as the interest rate goes down, okay, 
your payment amount goes down together with it, not staying the same or going to the opposite. So this is why the interest rate uh, risk is minimal for a floating rate note. Okay. As market interest rate changes, the coupon amount follows, so the interest rate risk is minimal for FRN. Now, uh, equity-related bond is the next one. Okay, equity-related bond.